Hey, everybody. How's everybody doing today? <laughs> That's me. That's this talk. All right. Um, so I'm going to talk about the future. But first, we're going to talk about the 90s. Uh, bait and switch. Um, I actually used to live up here in the 90s. Uh, I grew up up here. And uh, the fashion just hasn't changed at all. It was just, <laughs> it's just sweatshirts and fleece from REI. Back in the 90s, there'd be like some neon windbreakers, but it was basically the same. Um, so back in the 90s, there was actually like this real fight, like kind of a war over what the future of the internet would look like. Um, there wasn't really an established application platform that was globally accessible. And the view of a lot of people, including like the vast majority of the tech industry actually, and Bill Gates, was that you would have this thing that, that Bill liked to call the information superhighway, which was like you would just connect to companies' products and they would all be like unique, and then you would download their software and then connect to like their backends and stuff. It, to think about it now, it sounds relatively dystopic. Like you would just connect to these corporate sites and get their content. But like AOL was like the most successful version of this, right? Which was it was a content portal, and rather than using the web, you would use this content portal. And uh, everybody thought that this was going to win. Not a lot of people thought that the web was going to win. And if you're looking at them, like yeah, you can kind of see why. Like this is a lot more usable. Like there's a there's a taxonomy. I can click on things that I can do. And like what is over here? And uh, they had this amazing thing called like keywords. So like if I was like, hey, I have this awesome website. So you, you type like HTTP colon slash slash. And like the browsers were dumb. They would not fill this in for you. Uh, and, and then uh, Oprah, like every day on her show, would get up there and Oprah would be like, yeah, it's keyword Oprah. Look it up on AOL. And then you get all this content from Oprah on AOL. Like, of course this is going to win. Oprah's going to win. We're not going to win. Uh, and it's just like a generally better experience. But the thing that ended up happening is that the web had this thing called URLs, and then people who published things would link to other people's URLs. And that seems like a really simple thing, and it's like this primitive that we really take for granted. But like, the, if you wanted to publish something on AOL, your first step was like be Oprah, and then step two was like pay people to put up content. Um, on the web, like anybody can get an URL and you can put up stuff and then you can link to other people's stuff. Um, and er even though URLs were much worse to say than keywords, um, they allow these kinds of network effects to happen because you can link to other people's stuff. So like I make my Oprah blog, we didn't have blogs in the 90s, but you get my point. Um, <laughs> And then like somebody like publishes their list of favorite Oprah sites, and somebody makes an Oprah web ring, and this all kind of piles on together. And eventually what you end up with is this big network graph of different people providing different content. And so Oprah's content on AOL was a lot better than like any one person's favorite blogs or anything like that. But when you take the entire value of this big network and all this activity that's happening and all this exponential growth of this network around all that content, it just doesn't even compare anymore to the content that you had inside of these portals. And so these network effects are effectively why the web won. Um, and when we, when we go to compare the value of AOL and all of this like, really high-end, well-published content, we're comparing it to this, the value of the web, which is like this huge, exponentially growing graph of data and value. Um, that's why the web won. And I think that it's really easy today to forget about these primitives and why they were so important. We really need to unwind our view of the web today. When we think about the web, we think about standards and browsers and web frameworks and JavaScript. And like, that is all very important. And like, I, you know, I did Node.js stuff for nine years. I think that like, <laughs> JavaScript is very important. I used to run the Node Foundation. It is a very important thing. Um, but if we're thinking about what are the current limitations of the web and what are the primitives that we need in order to move forward, we really need to come back to the basics and unwind and think about URLs and links. So this is an URL. And there's basically three distinct parts. There's a transport, an authority, and then a reference to the content that you're getting. And you can sort of think about this backwards, right? First, you name content that you're going to publish. So you create some kind of name for it or like an index. Then there's the who. Who do, you, who do I ask for on the internet for this content, right? And then the transport says, like, how I ask this person for that content. And so when I link to somebody else's site, I'm actually giving them a central location to go and look this up. I'm saying, go to this authority and ask somebody for this content, right? And that's, that's the base primitive that we built 
everything for the last 20 years on. Um, centralization is baked into that primitive, right? It's federated in a, in a general sense, but like the whole web is federated, but every individual actor is actually centralized. So web applications are more than just static assets in the browser, right? Um, static assets in the browser I can manipulate. They're part of the open web. Like I can and do change like everything in Facebook. I'm sorry, I don't actually go to Facebook, but Twitter. Um, like, I remove all the ads, I change words that make me stressed out, like Trump, to things that don't stress me out, like daisies. Like, it's just, you know, I have like a series of dumb extensions to just change everything about that experience. The, the problem, though, is that like uh, Twitter and, and modern web applications in general aren't just these static assets. They pull information out of APIs. And those APIs are addressed by those URLs. They are like in these central locations. I can't just replace it the way that I can replace stuff that's in my browser. And so this means that data centralization is baked in to multi-user applications on the web today. There just isn't a good way for me to go and build an application that multiple users interact with and have relationships between those people's data without just centralizing it in a giant content silo and putting an API in front of it. So this is one of the largest cost drivers of modern applications. It makes them expensive. Um, like Brian's talk at the beginning of the day was brilliant because uh, you know it really is pennies now to just run thousands of function executions in the cloud. But if you log like a little bit of data from all of those calls, the storage cost of the logs is more expensive than the processing <laughs> of the actual cloud functions. Storage actually still does cost money, and unlike cloud functions that like ebb and flow with like how active your website is, storage only really increases over time. That's why it's such a good business to be in. Like we're here. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but but the the biggest problem that we really have with with these data silos isn't just that like, we can't get our data out of them or that they're opaque, which they are. It's that the, you have to basically build an ad model to support most large websites. And that, again, comes back to URLs and links. If I want to benefit from the network effects of the web, I have to be able to link you to my content, which means that my content has to be publicly accessible. It can't be behind a paywall. <laughs> so like any application that gets popular enough through these network effects is going to have to be ad supported in order to fund all these costs. Eventually, these ad-driven businesses started to get smarter and smarter. They started to adopt a lot of really good machine learning and new algorithms, and eventually what they figured out is that the best way to capture your attention for the longest amount of time is to keep moving you towards more and more extreme content. And so you're effectively radicalizing people like on purpose because it's a very good way to keep people watching YouTube like forever. Um, and our current, like we, we just have no recourse, right? Like the people in this room are developers. Like we, we're going to build the next version of one of these applications. And we have no other tool than to build it the same way that we've always built it and end up with all of the exact same problems again. Our only other resource is literally to yell at billionaires and try to ask them to change their algorithms to make less money. Like they didn't become billionaires by making less money off of these algorithms. It's just not gonna happen. Um, so anyway. Um, Let's like, so like how do we even start to address this problem? It seems like very, very like huge, and, and it is. I've spent like 10 years trying to think about it. And here's the real issue, right? So we have a web application. It talks to like multiple APIs. Those APIs end up talking to databases and other storage solutions. And like I've written databases, like a bunch of them for quite a while now. And what a database does really is that it, it takes a serialization of of like your data structure, and then it stores it on disk. Um, and it stores it on disk with a bunch of other computers, usually in a network, and it makes guarantees about the state of that data. The thing that you, you probably don't even realize as a developer because you kind of take it for granted is that there are state guarantees and consistency guarantees in that serialization to disk that bubble all the way up to the API and the state that, that comes out then, and then all the caching layers that we build on those APIs to make them fast. And so if we want to like remove this API layer that is so problematic and figure out how to distribute it and decentralize it and make it part of the open web, we actually <laughs> we have to go and dig all the way into where that data gets serialized and bring that into, like, into the browser, into the open web, into a space that we can actually work with. So this will become a little bit clearer as, as, I, as I move along, but that's why we have to dig so deep into this problem is because you, all of these layers in between have consistency guarantees that bubble up all the way from how you store data. We have to literally start to rethink what happens when we have a data structure in memory and we need to share it 
or to serialize it long term? Like what happens when it leaves the space of the memory of our programs? That's the problem that we need to solve. So if we come back to the URL, like we, we, the, the URL has a central authority in it. We're going to have all the same problems. So like, let's get rid of the transport and the authority. Um, also, because we don't have an authority, we don't have like, like the authority also provides a namespace. So we can't have like these human names that we go and create for things. Um, what are we going to do? Uh, so eventually people figured out that you can do this thing where you hash the content. Um, and people have been using hashes for a very long time. But every five years or so, we look at hashing, and we realize that there's like another problem that we can solve with this and another whole scope of issues that we can solve with it. And so our view of what we can do with cryptographic hashing keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. right? And I promise I'm not going to talk about blockchains. Um, so. <laughs> We, we, have this, so we have this primitive now uh, called content addressability, um, or content addressing, right? And the interesting thing about content addressability is that we get a way to address data without an authority, without a location, without a transport. We can get the data from anywhere, from anybody. And we have a cryptographic guarantee that, like, you told me about this hash, and I got it from, like, some rando, uh, and I looked at the data and said, oh, yeah, it does match this hash. <laughs> it's kind of brilliant. Um, and then if that data in, has inside of it other hashes, then changing any of those links inside of that data changes the hash. And so we have another cryptographic guarantee if the data ever changes. I'm just going to move along and start to show some of this in practice at this point, because if either you're following along or you're not, and you're not going to get it if I keep just talking. Uh, OK. so. <laughs> Um, at Protocol Labs, we, we, we created this thing called a, a CID, or a content identifier. So CID is just a, a very, very flexible way to say, OK, we, ha we have a hash, and then we need to know how to interpret that hash to get links out of it, because we're not all going to use the exact same data format. So that's all it is. So you can think of it as like sort of like a, a replacement for the URL that uses cryptographic hashing. Okay? So um, if, if I want to like, you know, publish my blog data, and you want to go read it, you would say, oh, go get this, this content hash. Uh, and then you would get back this object that has my posts in it, OK? And here's, here's the fun thing. It just doesn't matter how you get this hash, right? Like, I'm not going to talk about a bunch of peer-to-peer -peer technologies and DHTs and ways to get at data, because it literally doesn't matter. You can pull it out of a centralized store. You can pull it out of a local storage cache. Like, any way that, uh, nobody cares. Like, <laughs> it's all, you have the same cryptographic guarantees. So this is how we can create truly decentralized data structures without worrying about like, oh, well, did I authenticate with the right peer-to-peer -peer network and things like that. Anyway, inside of this data structure, I have a list of posts. And then one of those posts just points to another CID. It's just a link, right? We're just creating new link data, just like we did on the internet. Um, and then when I go and get that CID from wherever, again, um, I will then get the text for that post. Fairly simple, OK? Um, but now, Sally like, has a list of her favorite blogs. And she's like, oh, yeah, well, Michael's blog is this hash. So boom, that's in my list. I'm now publishing that data. And Heather creates an aggregator. And she's like, oh, cool, there's this new link now. And now we're starting to build some of the same network effects that we had in the early web with links for data. So all of my data that I publish, all my tweets, they're not just like locked up in Twitter or locked up in Facebook or wherever. They're actually part of like a completely decentralized system that spans the internet where anybody can link to anybody's data. So the really cool thing here is like different people can be hosting this data, right? It doesn't have to live in the same place. Um, if I'm only looking at Heather's aggregator and I don't really want to go look at my blog, I don't even have to resolve that link. Um, or all of this could be on my computer, because I pulled it all down to read all of this data offline. Nothing changes in the data structures. It's all just content addressed. OK, so let's look at like a, a more kind of real world use case. So uh, different universities publish genomics data, um, different scientific data. And then people run regression analysis over that data. The way this looks today is that they publish it in like just random different FTP sites and tarballs and stuff, and then everybody goes and downloads that, and like different universities try to mirror each other's data, but they all use different protocols, and it's, it's like really, really messy. So if we, if we imagine this world where we have content address data, and that you actually put all of that genomics data into a content address, then I can create a regression data set that is also a hash, 
that just points to all of the hashes that I'm going to run against, right, at all of these different places. And I can pull all of that data down in real time from all of these universities or mirrors of those universities or local caches. Again, um, all of the sort of deliverability semantics are then removed from the data structures. Um, so we get a lot more reliability, we get a lot more permanence and like archivability, which is really important. Um, and then the really cool thing is that when I get that result, that regression result that ran across that entire data set, I can point down at individual parts of the data, right? Like you, the same way that you would look, look down and look at individual posts, I can look at, you know, this is just the part of the genomics data that matched some query that I had. Um, and again, I can pull down all that data and re-host it and republish it, but actually my data structure is the only thing that I worry about, need to worry about being published and staying alive. All of these links that go off to other places, those are in the network, those exist, I don't have to re-host them. I'm just adding new value to, or, and, and also deriving value from the data that's in the network. Similarly, like, let's imagine like a Twitter that's built on decentralized data structures. So, Bob, Alice, and Sally, and Heather are all publishing their feeds somewhere, um, and my feed is just a pointer to all of their feeds. That's what I'm looking at, right? And my favorites is just pointing to all of the individual treats inside of their data structures, and either they're hosting them, or I'm hosting them, or it doesn't matter, right? Um, that's kind of the point. And of course, this data structure is the exact, this looks exactly like the slide from a little bit ago, even though these data structures are completely different. <laughs> Um, like the way that we would want to do, you know, genomics data and the way that we would do tweets looks very different from like, you know, the actual data structure's point of view. But I'm able to display it in the same way here because it's all built on this same really, really tiny primitive, this content identifier. Um, so uh, CID is a pointer that spans the internet, essentially. You can think about it like when you're building data structures and you're building B trees, like if you've you know, had a Google interview and then never done that again, um, <laughs> you, you have pointers to data. Uh, it's like a very simple programming concept. But if you think about a pointer that can span the internet, then now you can imagine building out data structures like B trees that, that span more than just you know, the memory space inside of my hard drive. Um, and also don't just span you know, a particular data silo for a particular website. This quote is me, I said that I'm smart. Um, so, so, but at the end of the day, what we end up with is a network of data. This hugely giant, valuable network of data, right? Effectively, like an internet of data. Just built on this simple primitive, right? Now, if you start to imagine all this data out there existing and all these people building value on top of it, you stop trying to compare this to a particular Amazon offering, or this to Facebook, or this to Twitter, right? Those are huge applications. It's hard to imagine anybody ever competing with them. But just like my AOL blog was not competing, or sorry, my Oprah blog was not competing with Oprah's content, the whole network was competing with that content. In the same way, if we're creating this internet of data and driving all of this value, those old applications that are locked up in data silos are actually competing with the entire value of the network. That means that we can actually win. We can actually like move all of this data and start moving our, our next application bases all into this new model where we're, we're not locked up in all these companies and all these data silos anymore. So that's the vision that, that we have that we're trying to build. Um, I'm working on that at Protocol Labs. A lot of people are working on this. A lot of people are working, looking at content addressability. Um, we're, it's like the earliest days ever. <laughs> so like, we are still implementing fundamental data structures. We're doing a lot of new research and new work. Um, if you're really interested in this, I would like really encourage you to go uh, check out this spec repository. This is probably like the best list of grammar and current work that, that we have like a, in like a more human readable format. And we're of course working on like a lot of new content. And then on top of these data structures, we built things like IPFS, the interplanetary file system, uh, which can move your files around and all of that. Um, IPLD stands for Interplanetary Linked Data, yeah, because we, we love uh, acronyms that immediately make the intergalactic song by Beastie Boys play in my head, so. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, that, that, that is my talk. Uh, I finished up a little bit early, very nice. I always talk faster than I wanted to. So thank you so much, and uh, please join us on making the, the next version of the web.